Hi guys, welcome to your screencast for your next lesson, which is on the influence of public schools. Okay, so we are still in post-1850 Britain. Um, I'm just going to go through the specification so you know exactly what you're needed um, to learn for your exams. So, first of all, we have got influence of public schools on the promotion and organisation of sports and games. We've also got the influence of public schools on the promotion of ethics through sports and games. We need to discuss this thing called the cult of athleticism, the meaning, the nature and the impact of the cult of athleticism. And then finally we need to know about the spread and export of games and the game ethic. Okay. So this is kind of like the chart that we've we've seen before. So we've done it pre-industrial, now we're doing post-1850 industrial Britain. So you would have gone through already um, these factors and how they're different in post-1850 to as they are pre-industrial. So for example, income. So the lower classes had an, had an increase in income due to working in the factories that we developed. Um, time, they had more time as well, especially on a Saturday afternoon because of the half days. Um, transport you did about, so for example, um, the development of railways, which meant that we could actually play games further afield nationally, which then led to England versus Scotland, which led to um, the Football Association. Um, education and literacy. So due to the public schools, um, the boys were being um, kind of educated, so they're literate, which means they could write rules, and these written rules were developed. This led to national governing bodies, for example, Football Association in 1963. So what we need to be aware of is this influence of public schools. Now, in this era, <clears throat> without the public schools, none of this would have really been possible. Okay, so the influence of public schools is, is huge when it comes to um, post-1850 industrial Britain. Let's get on to this first point now. So the first point was um, the influence of public schools on promotion and organisation of sports and games. We need to ask ourselves kind of three key questions here when it comes to promotion and organisation, how public schools influence them. What we need to ask ourselves is what did public schools have that other institutions or, or other places in the country at that time didn't have? So what did public schools have? Who did public schools have? And how did they organise? So before we get into this massively, we need to understand that at the beginning of the 19th century, sport was not a feature in public schools, really. Headmasters were not in favour of sport. This only became important in the middle of the 19th century. Okay, And then sport based became an important part of education for the upper classes and the middle classes. Now, in these public schools, some of the activities and sports developed um, became popular and basically what we know today with rules, facilities and organised ways of playing. Um, I need to go on about this Dr. Thomas Arnold for a second. So before Dr. Thomas Arnold, public schools or parents of boys that went to public schools were concerned with the treatment of their boys. Um, kind of the environment within public schools was cruel and the younger boys were being exploited um, by the older boys. For example, they were being servants, they were um, experiencing brutality and bullying. So schools had to take action or face the prospect of parents taking their children somewhere else. So Dr. Thomas Arnold here, this chap here, he wanted his pupils to grow up as moral Christian men. Therefore, he revised this kind of bullying culture that was um, in public schools and promoted more regular sports, which kind of wanted to encourage exercise and healthy competition. So we'll go on about him in a bit more detail um, later on, but he is important when it comes to this. So first of all, what did they have? So, public school had borders. They had people that were there for terms at a time. So, day, morning, daytime, evening. So this meant that these pupils had time to play and practice the games that were being played at, at public school. Parents were paying. So, it was a fee-paying system. So, we had specialist facilities and coaches. For example, cricket coaches were being employed. Finally... These public schools had loads of space. Okay, so they had space to build these facilities, e.g. pitches, cricket pitches, for example. So they had money to build, space to build, coaches to have time as well. So that is what they had in comparison to other kind of facilities around at that time. 
So who did they have? Now I've just mentioned this Dr. Thomas Arnold. They had headmasters such as Dr. Thomas Arnold who promoted sport. He is a key figure. Like I said, through Christianity, he wanted to develop this ethic okay, of integrity, endeavour, sportsmanship through sport. He was not an advocate of sport himself per se. He was a religious man. He was a clergyman. However, he realised that using sport, you could develop these kind of gentlemen that we will go through um, throughout this um, screencast. So el who else did they have? They had ex-public schoolboys as games masters. So ex-pupils would come in as elderly, elder people now and they would become games masters. They would be used or kind of seen as role models for these younger boys. So that's really important. And then finally, how did they organise or promote sports? They did this via into house games or into school games. Thomas, Thomas Arnold or Dr. Thomas Arnold created the house system. Okay. So this influenced the formation of competitive sports teams within the school or within the public school. So for example, here, rugby school, you have school house versus college house. Dr. Thomas Arnold kind of developed these different houses and this bred competitiveness, this bred this term muscular Christianity, which Dr. Thomas Arnold kind of helped develop, and it's linked to sport with a, being a Christian gentleman. Okay, so this this is quite important. So this kind of establishing link between sport and games and moral and ethical character. This whole concept developed um, kind of another character through cult athleticism. So the term, or it's often referred to as cult athleticism, which we're going to be going on about on the next slide. So it's ethics and values promoted. You had muscular Christianity. So Dr. Thomas Arnold kind of wanted teamwork, endeavor, sportsmanship, integrity, leadership, and courage. Before we go on to the next slide, I just want you to be able to write down what did they have, who did they have, how did they organize, and be able to get these key terms down without using your notes. Okay, so that's what we need before you come into the lesson. So this next part, this cult of athleticism, meaning, nature, and impact. We need to know that, and then we need to know how public schools influenced the spread and export of games and the game ethics. So first of all, what does the cult of athleticism, what does it kind of like mean? So it, it's a craze, okay, so cult, you like to think of the terms potentially like a craze, okay, so it's a craze for sports and particularly team games within public schools. And the nature of these were physical endeavor and moral integrity. This is key, okay, so games were often compulsory and were played with athleticism, which translates to Physical endeavour and moral integrity, really important, these kind of muscular Christianity values, physical endeavour and moral integrity. So then what impact did these have? Okay, so these games and sports spread nationwide and worldwide, and we need to know how they were spread nationwide and worldwide. So we've got... Public school boys who went off to university took the games with them. Now, these there becomes a problem when you've got different boys from different public schools have different rules for different games. Therefore, they're all um, literate. They can all read. They can all write. So they start. They developed a common rule book. Now, this was developed through this term here, melting pot. Okay. So what happened was they get to university. You'd have boys from different schools with different rules. All the rules were put together. And then they came out with the actual rules for a specific game. And then from that, you had national governing bodies established as well. So, for example, the Football Association was developed in 1863. Now, it was 1863 was when they actually decided to kind of get rid of handling the ball. So handling the ball was outlawed. Okay. And at the end of that year, players from around the country came together to form the Football Association. So that's what happened. Okay. And then you had a national governing body from that. And this is all from the boys that went to um, and attended public schools. So these boys were then national governing body administrators. The games were also spread um, to workers via careers such as industrialists and vicars. So, for example, these public school boys would go and own factories and in their factories they would create a football team. For example, Arsenal, the Gunners, yep, that came from um, <clears throat> the factories. And then you've also got vicars. So, vicars would then go into their parishes and create football teams as well. Aston Villa, for example, came from this kind of concept here. Um, 
<clears throat> this led to national competitions such as the FA Cup. Now, if you're thinking 1850, we now have railways, so we can actually have national competitions. And then finally, how were sports put worldwide? Well, these public school boys often went and became army officers and clergymen and missionaries abroad. So they took games to the British Empire, such as Australia and India. And this is where or how cricket got to Australia and it got to India. And now it turns out that quite a lot of time they're better than us at it. But that's originally where it came from. Public school boys would go as army officers or clergymen to the British Empire, Australia, India. And they would then take with them these co this common rule book, the rules for cricket to these different countries. So that's how the Court of Athleticism, well, that's the meaning, nature and impact of the Court of Athleticism. And this is how public schools influence the spread and export of games and the game ethic as well with regards to sportsmanship, etc. So make sure you've got Cornell Notes on all of this here and the previous slide. So this information here as well. Make sure you've got good key questions. For example, um, pupils had time to play and practice games because they were often what? B, boarders, okay. So had to pay money. This meant that you could get what? Specialist facilities and coaches, etc. So make sure you get those down and um, I'll see you in next lesson. Thank you, bye.